He is a god of the game. Almost four months back, Guardiola made a bizarre midfield choice that led to him his first Champions League title. Well, on Saturday, it was the other way round at the Stamford Bridge. Is Ansu Mani party the answer to Barca's problem or the fact that Kuman was suspended for the Levante game? Sarri won the actual game, but did Mourinho beat him at the PR game? Is this the beginning of the new dominating era for Indian women's cricket? Let's go! Absolutely world class! Hello and welcome to episode 35 of Sports Charcha where we are going to talk about a very unique weekend in EPL, a great week for Indian cricket and to do that as always we have Ishan with us. Hi guys, hi everyone. Hope you had a great weekend like I did. I am still recovering from a very heavily alcohol fueled weekend. So what I'm going to do this week, we're going to switch it up a bit. I'm going to be asking Bala a couple of key highlights that he thought which happened in the Premier League, in La Liga and in the Serie And then we'll move on to other topics. So let's start with the big game. Uh, Chelsea versus City. Bala, you know, it was a 1 0 victory for City against the card. I think both of us I think, uh, called City, uh, Chelsea winning it. Uh, what was the key defining moment that you thought actually turned the game for City? It's not the defining moment. I would say one of the things that Pep did that really worked was Bernardo Silva. Uh, he kind of played alongside Rodri, and every City player where were very, very committed to what they wanted to do. In fact, like if you see the way the players celebrated after the final whistle, it felt like they just won the Champions League. It They just took a big monkey off their back. I mean, Pep lost three games against uh, Tuchel and he finally got that off his back. And it was a little weird with Tuchel's tactics also. See, this is something Tuchel have in his kitty. He has shown this <laughs> with Dortmund. He has shown this a lot with PSG. He too have these brain fade moments where he will just start some random players. He didn't do it with Chelsea for a very long time. And I was thinking that, okay, now this is a new one we are looking at. But no, this game, I think he tweaked a little. He just went a little too much, I believe. See, uh, the problem that Lampard and Sari had was to play Kante and Jorginho alongside. Both of them had that issue. Tuchel, I believe, solved that issue very, very smartly. Now, what he's trying to do right now is to add Kovacic also to the mix and making it more complicated for himself. I That didn't work. But full credit to Guardiola and City players. They were just, they were relentless. They ran a lot. They ran more than Chelsea. Ruben Diaz, again, excellent, excellent performance. So, a great game. So, I think let's talk about the other big game, uh, which I would like to label as a twist of fate game. Uh, the North London derby, Arsenal versus Tottenham. Uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago when we were on the podcast, Arsenal were in the relegation zone and Tottenham were, at, were on the top of the table. But looking at the result and looking at how Arsenal have been, you know, getting the results in the last couple of games, what... What what's happened to Arsenal? What's changed? And you know how how did the match go? So Arsenal, well, one thing very clearly changed uh, personnel. Thomas Partey, I think, is back from injury. The last two three games he played, so that really did make some difference. And yesterday he probably played his best game for Arsenal. If I am not too optimistic, he did play his best game for Arsenal and uh, best game for himself in a very long time ever since he came out of Atletico. So that was a very very key moment. But on the other hand, Tottenham have fallen so bad. Nuno was the manager of the month. Uh, August month ka manager he was in September he hasn't won a single game yet he has lost all the three games the conference league game ended in a draw I think he won the Carabao Cup game but otherwise there were no victories so it was more I thought it was more again uh, Arsenal fans we don't have an agenda <laughs> it felt like more of Tottenham being really bad than Arsenal being really good Arsenal were good I'm not taking anything away from their performance, but Tottenham were very bad. It's it's a crisis. It's, it's actually what might 
Yeah. What might Harry Kane be thinking right now? <laughs> oh man. I mean, he felt someone. This is what Gary Neville said. Uh, Kane and Son are looking like two kids who got their balloons burst in a birthday party. <laughs> That's the exact word he used. <laughs> I mean, they did look like that. Oh. Uh, Tottenham again were very defensive. They were too defensive. Kane tried a bit. I mean, he had a very bad game. In fact, third goal was his mistake. He lost the ball. Uh, like a very, uh, he lost the ball, and that kind of created the counter attack for Arsenal. So he had a very poor game. See, we don't know what's going on in his mind. Whether he's a hundred percent there or not, we can't say it. We can only speculate. But Everyone started asking this question now, and you cannot, you cannot escape this argument, this topic right now. If you are a Tottenham fan, if you are associated with Tottenham, got it. Okay, so let's talk about the other, not a big game, but quite a game which created a lot of headlines. Specifically, it was the last game Bruno Fernandez would take a penalty kick in his United career, at least till when Cristiano is playing. <laughs> uh, Villa versus Man United. Uh, I would say quite a huge upset. Uh, Aston Villa coming up with the three yeah. points away from home at Old Trafford. Uh, a last-minute penalty miss by Bruno Fernandez. What went on? But you know, I think the main highlight was Emiliano Martinez uh, <laughs> and and his mind mind. I won't say you know expletives, but mind dashery uh, to Bruno Fernandez. What went on there? What did you think? See, I am going to ask you another question, like a follow-up question. You have Cristiano Ronaldo in your team. There is a penalty. Forget about the remaining ten players. It could be Messi. It could be the Brazilian Ronaldo. It could be Pele. It could be Maradona. It could be Cruyff. Who will you give the penalty to, irrespective of how many penalties he has scored or not scored? If it's the last game and it's going to decide the game. There is no doubt. I'll give it to Ronaldo. So that is where my problem is. See now, Bruno Fernandez is not a bad choice. He has missed only two penalties for United in 23 games. I am not. I am not entirely blaming Ole a lot for this decision, but there is a slight bit of emotion and uh, uh, not being rational. Was there in that decision? Cristiano Ronaldo is clearly the best penalty taker. He should have been the first number one designated penalty taker for United. I'm not sure why it wasn't there. Now I'm not saying United lost the game because of that missed penalty. They lost the game because they didn't play very well in the remaining eight and nine minutes of the game. But Ole is in serious trouble now. They have. But do uh, you, Bala, I have a question for you uh, regarding this, right? Uh, in fact, in that game, Bruno Fernandez was actually captaining United at the end when he was actually taking the penalty. Who is who should the decision go down to? Yeah, because Fernandez is historically, at least for the last couple of years, been the designated penalty kick taker. Do you think it's on Ronaldo to say, "Hey, I'll take it. I'll base, face the brunt if I if I miss it. I have enough, you know, credits on my back to deal with the, you know, deal with the hate." Uh, or is it Bruno Fernandez who says, you know, Ronaldo? I'm not feeling probably up to it. Why don't you do it? Or is it Ole's call? See, this is what I have heard from ex-players, coaches, and everyone that a team before getting into the field, in fact, the squad in in itself have a priority of penalty takers. So you have number one, number two, number three, number four, well defined, pretty much for the entire league. Few teams change aage piche based on their uh, whatever penalty taking forms. So what Ole said in his post match press conference was that Bruno Fernandez was a number one designated penalty taker for the club. So if Bruno Fernandez and Cristiano Ronaldo both are there on the pitch, it's Bruno Fernandez call. So what usually happens is is Bruno Fernandez call. To whether give it to Cristiano Ronaldo or not, maybe he didn't want to. And to be fair for to be fair to Ronaldo, he didn't show any emotions, nothing on the field. He took it in his chin. In fact, like he was the first one to go and console Bruno. See, now we know for sure who is going to take the next penalty for United. It's one hundred percent Cristiano Ronaldo. But I still think what will happen, what's going to happen is uh, 
there's going to be a game where united are 2 nil 3 nil up they are going to get a penalty somewhere in the 90th minute ronaldo is going to take the ball go to bruno fernandes give it to him bruno fernandes steps up and scores and everyone's happy bala <laughs> yeah. is all for the story book closing of you know <laughs> of storylines but as as the ball as the penalty kick shot bruno took as the, the ball still you know hasn't landed as yet Let's move on to the next game, uh, which is Brentford versus Liverpool. I think this is the last, you know, really interesting game that happened in the Premier League. Uh, Brentford actually, you know, taking two points away from Liverpool. They were trailing uh, till the death of the game, and it finished three-three. What were your thoughts on that? Oh, brilliant game, man! This see, this was one of the game where. uh as a liverpool fan like i don't want to analyze this game this was just a super game to watch end to end stuff i have seen van dijk play for liverpool for the last 3 years watched him closely pretty much every game i haven't seen a forward bullying van dijk as much as tony did like he couldn't win headers van dijk was losing headers to ivan tony long ball headers i would i have hardly seen van dijk do that like not even in his worst day So they were absolutely brilliant. See, there is a bit of boldness and stupidity in what Brentford did. Now, what they did was they played Liverpool's game, which is the energy game, the high high pressure, the uh, high press game. Now, the problem in playing that type of football against Liverpool is it can end in your favor, and that will be the greatest game you might have ever played in your history. but it can go horribly wrong like if liverpool could get their act together they could have scored six seven goals yesterday like sala missed not yesterday i mean day before yesterday sala missed the sitter there were many chances that were missed see this game should have ended ideally 5 7 or something to liverpool <laughs> if most of the chances were actually taken but brentford full full credit to them for having their balls to go out and play a game against liverpool playing liverpool's game against liverpool and coming out on top F- absolute absolute respect for brentford in fact there is a shot in the game where the brentford's goalkeeper makes a superb save towards the end of the game it was 3-3 liverpool going for the win he makes a brilliant save there is a shot where both uh, thomas frank brentford's coach and klopp are looking at each other and going like wow what just happened types so now moving on to spain uh, a lot of interesting games that happened in la liga uh, but we're going to cover the three major ones obviously the three most important teams for us personally uh, every other club fan please don't get upset uh, let's start with atletico madrid defending champions finally not being able to score and rescue a game losing 1-0 to deportivo alaves What were your thoughts on that? Has the has the curtain finally fallen on them rescuing points at the death? Yeah, it has finally caught up. Luck has finally caught up with uh, Atletico Madrid. This is the game where everything that worked towards the end for them didn't actually work. They had only about one shot on target, I believe. I think one or two. But anyway, whatever. They hardly had any shot on target. All of us were exceptionally. well drilled and well coached the the problem with uh, this game was alavés scored a very early goal like i think somewhere within the first 5 minutes or something they scored a goal after that they just simply shut shop they did nothing i mean they hardly had about 20 25% uh, what what do you call uh, possession so this was an atletis game atletis usually they are the ones who will do this to opponents so I think Alavés did better than that. No, and uh, and I I just wanted to mention, you know, there's a new act in Vegas uh, at the MGM Grand. Uh, instead of David Copperfield doing the missing act, it's now going to be Antoine Griezmann who's going to be headlining the MGM Grand Magic Show uh, because he has officially disappeared from the face of the earth when it comes to club football. What's happened to him? Oh, this is this is the big story, man. I mean, at one level, I feel a little sorry for him, but ever since the World Cup, he hasn't been in his best form. I mean, at least in club football. I'm talking about the last season with Atleti and whatever is two, three horrible season with Barca. Now the way he has started again with Atleti, it's very bad. See, this is one of those signings. See, first of all, 
he went to barcelona and it looked like a mismatch like he shouldn't have done that now he has come back to atleti and again it feels like he shouldn't have done that i mean how can a player i mean such a high profile player world cup winner one of the biggest players in in the world right now i mean easily is one of the top 5 top 10 players in terms of talent and skill easily i mean how he's been so poorly advised i don't know it's 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 very sad to see such a talent not doing anything on the football pitch cool so let's move on to the other madrid team not much to talk about it was a not a very entertaining nil nil draw but more importantly for ancelotti's team due to atleti losing uh, you know they still have the, uh, the lead in the in the table the three point lead uh, a clean sheet which is very important uh, and i think you know looking at the highlights of the game madrid's minds as usual were only on the champions league but it was a important like it copped a complex game against villarreal no teams were harmed villarreal this is their fifth draw in six games they are becoming the draw masters in la liga right now oh uh, meaning i feel that they they have always you know they're such a good team but they just don't perform well enough consistently uh and i think this team this year this season they're a little weaker than what they were yes last year when they won the europa league there some key players left uh but i think they'll they'll do fine they'll still get a european position by the end of the season but to conclude our la liga conversation let's talk about you know a really and me as a not a barca fan but a really heartwarming story uh of barcelona winning no i'm i'm joking uh, but that's also quite a heartwarming story barcelona finally winning but it was all about ansu fati the new number 10 for barcelona he came on for the last 15 minutes and scored on the i think the 92nd minute after a really long Uh, injury layoff almost a year and a half due to an acl tear uh what were your feelings when you saw that happen and what was this, the celebration with the players etc it was great to watch yeah it was i felt very happy for him first of all barca won the game without coman on the touch line he was uh, banned uh, for his antics in the last game so i i don't know if you want to take any <laughs> signs from that <laughs> <laughs> but to talk about uh, Fati I mean this is really very heartwarming I mean he's a new number 10 of Barcelona I mean thinking about who was wearing that jersey before and he in fact everyone felt he is the right choice to wear the jersey came in scored and he immediately went to his doctor the one who actually helped him out of this injury hugged him and I think his family was there it was a very very heartwarming and a very nice thing to happen I mean for whatever <laughs> horrible things that has been happening to this club for the last 3 4 months there is something to cheer about and barcelona fans around the world will hang on to anything that will make them happy because in next two days they are going to play a champions league game no one knows how that's going to turn out but yeah it was a good good result i mean luke de jong scored forget about ansu fati scoring luke de jong scored <laughs> that should be the news <laughs> but tell me bala now with ansu fati coming back dembele also on his way back you know if you look at the squad not looking at the form they've got a pretty decent squad pretty young squad minus luke de jong uh do you think this moment this surge of happiness that ansu fati got to the fans and the club in general uh do you think this might change the fortunes of barcelona i mean it's not like a yes or no question but there's definitely a better feeling and that is always a good thing now for this to continue and to become a successful season now i don't know what is the yardstick for success this season for me as a barcelona fan my yardstick of my success will be a, a comfortable top 4 finish a good run in champions league and probably going for the copa del rey that will probably be my best season for barcelona this season and the most important point is don't make losses at least take some profits this season so that will be my way of looking at a successful season but this can turn we can change things a little bit as you said they have a great squad barcelona real madrid i have seen it over a long time these two are very moody teams like if they are not in it they are just not in it like you can put the 11 best players on the pitch if their minds are not there in the game they are just not there in the game and it can come back like this like one game they'll go final down and next game they can come back and win 6-0 so 
so it can happen it's a good sign but i'll be cautiously optimistic well said well said moving on to the italian league the serie a some of some real banger games that happened over the weekend but let's first start with the derby de italia uh, that is roma versus lazio at the stadio olimpico where mourinho lost to sari did you see the game did you catch the game did you see the highlights what what happened so i was on and off so the north london derby and this one was going side by side so i was first watching north london derby for 30 minutes and then this for again 30 minutes aage piche aage piche i was walking this was this was a very unseria game man roma had 20 shots they had eight shots on target pepe reina the forgotten man had a very good game at goal for lazio some very really good last ditch defending lazio scored two quick goals and who guess who scored the second goal pedro <laughs> pedro scored the second goal now forget about the game the game was extremely exciting brilliant game 3-2 everyone was thoroughly enjoyed but once then the game was over right i saw some of the most weird things that i've ever i've never seen on a football pitch especially after a game's been done so just to give guys uh, the listeners a quick context Lazio and Roma both are from Rome and both play in the same stadium like both have the same home stadium is Stadio de Olimpica now once when Lazio won so Lazio's uh, club emblem is an eagle so they have this club mascot a real eagle and Sari went and I was he was holding the eagle to the fans for like few seconds after he won the game and while he was doing that Mourinho decided that I am going to hog limelight now. Instead of going to the dressing room, he calls all the players right in the middle of the pitch and he gives a team talk <laughs> in front of the entire stadium. <laughs> oh uh, God! It quickly turned into a PR game from a football game so fast. <laughs> But I think and Mourinho is so good for football, for football health. You know, he is amazing. and he does these antics just to keep attention but i think it just keeps the fans glued to their screens wherever mourinho goes uh, he is box office man he is pure box, he's box office. office quickly to wrap up the rest of the what happened in the rest of the game that happened in serie i think what let's talk about the match of the weekend for us uh inter milan versus atalanta an entertaining you know exciting draw uh did you, what did you see the highlights you watched the game what happened So I couldn't watch the game. I saw the highlights actually. It was really I mean the it was highlights so I couldn't really say how exciting that game was but it was brilliant. They intermissed the penalty and in the last minute in the last seconds of the game Handanovic actually parried the ball outside the corner and that wasn't noticed and that was turned into a goal. I went to VAR and it was it was chopped the goal was chopped off it was very emotional it was a brilliant game this game is probably one of the flagship games to show how italian football have changed over the years i mean this game in total had about 40 41 shots this is like very this is unprecedented numbers for serie a like you normally won't see these many attacking shots in a serie a game so to me atlanta the new inter the new ac milan all these teams are actually making serie a very very exciting yeah i think you're completely bang on about that you know barring juventus who probably the only team that is going down every other you know there's a significant fight for the top 4 uh, which is unheralded at least in the last 7 8 years uh, in serie a you know you see the likes of napoli who are top of the table uh, undefeated this season and they again won by the way the weekend you see ac milan coming back a resurgence of ac milan inter milan obviously defending champions roma with mourinho sari and lazio uh it and, and let's not forget atalanta who have been like literally the stars of italian football have you know i would say single handedly changed how italian football is perceived due to the way they play football uh it's really good to watch and i sometimes feel that it somehow needed juventus to fall for italy to rise quickly to con- conclude serie a i think let's talk about the maldini family against creating their imprint onto the you know the history of ac milan 
डॅनियल मल्डिनी पावलो मल्डिनी सन सेझारे मल्डिनी ग्रँड सन स्कोरिंग हिज फर्स्ट एव्हर गोल फॉर ए सी मिलान वॉट अ ग्रेट मोमेंट आय थिंक हिज गोन बी अ ग्रेट प्लेअर हिज यू नो प्रिटी स्किलफुल हॅज अ नॅक फॉर गोल सो हिज गोन बी अ प्लेअर टू वॉच अँड अमेझिंग यु नो अमेझिंग स्टोरी फॉर ए सी मिलान This week on Indian Cricket, we are not going to talk about CSK being on top of IPL table, Virat Kohli defeating Rohit Sharma, no, that is not what we are going to talk about. This week, we are going to talk about our Indian women's cricket who have made a lot of noise in the last 4-5 days. To remind you guys, they are currently at Australia playing a full series against the Australian team. They are playing 3 ODIs, I think 1 test and then about 2 or 3 T20s Australian cricket team and this Australian cricket team have the longest unbeaten streak in cricket ever in ODI cricket ever they have when they entered the series they had 24 matches unbeaten practically they won 8 3 match series 3 nil 3 nil 3 nil 3 nil <laughs> first game it was uh, it was a no contest. Australian women completely dominated the Indian team. But the second one was a true humdinger. It went till the last delivery. And Australia just nicked it. Just nicked it. But tell me, Bala, you know, obviously we're going to talk about the third game where history was made. Uh, you know, other than the usual suspects for the Indian women's team, who are the players that have really, you know, got your attention and you think are going to be world beaters? Like, apart from your usual Spritis and Shefalis and uh, Deepti Sharmas. There were four players who I really wanted to thoda follow more and follow their career and they are looking really, really promising. First one, to me the number one is the new uh, wicketkeeper, Richa Ghosh. I think she's 17 or 18. She came in three down in the second game and uh, we were in a kind of a tricky situation after a very good start. We were down to 95 for 3 or something. So we needed someone to stay there in the middle with Smriti, you know, get the scoreboard taking, etc. She was exceptional. And it was the second game, 17 year old. She showed me how it's a, this could be a little thoda exaggerating, but early signs of Hasi. A player who can score the singles and twos, very smart, but can also score the big boundaries. There's a brilliant mix with her. And at number 5, she is a talent to watch out for. Like a very busy player. I haven't seen this kind of player in women's cricket a lot. They generally score a lot of boundaries. She's someone who likes to score singles and twos. Keep the scoreboard ticking. So that is one talent I'm totally looking forward to. On the bowling side, there is this player called Pooja. Uh, she can bat a bit. She can just throw a bat around. But she's... Again, a brilliant bowler, very smooth action. I mean, we are looking, we are crying for a replacement. Julan Goswami is still bowling. But we really need someone to take that mantle over from her. I mean, how long she can keep bowling. So, Pooja and there is another uh, one called Meghna. Meghna's action, if you can, just go and watch in Hotstar or, I don't know, Sonil or somewhere. She has a slight bit of Darren Gaw in her. So, oh, wow. again, a very smooth action. So, just watch out for her. Like, she's again one of the bowlers who is who I'm really looking forward to. And the last one is Yastika Bhatia, a batter. Again, a very elegant stroke maker. Number four player. So, she comes two down. So, again, something to look forward to. So, this is an exciting time for Indians women cricket. We have talent coming out from every corner. So, these players are playing around the world, which is only helping them to be better. But I sincerely wish BCCI start Indian women's IPL very, very soon. And I think, you know, it's uh, in women, women's cricket by and large, I fear that it's now moving towards more of a T20 shorter format. Uh, you know, I want women's cricket to be more test-centric because that is the true challenge of the game, right? You know, one test match series is not a series at all. It's a one-off exhibition game. Uh, so, bring a lot of the things you've to, you know, ICC should bring a lot of the things that they've done for, you know, men's test cricket to revitalize it like the World Test Championship. Bring some of that, you know, masala into the women's game and I, I you'll see a lot of up-and-coming players who are not you know, shorter format stars, but, you know, have the patience and the grit to last five days coming up for both India and any other team in the world. And that will actually 
ensure the sustainability of women's cricket yes i completely agree with you there has to be and will be a women's ipl coming very soon but the indian team right now going to england and even australia to play you know domestic t20 championships has given them a lot of exposure and that is all only going to make them better players yeah there is one interesting point about this series so this series is is one whole series so they have a point system across the three formats so there is no separate odi winner t20 winner or a test winner there is a series winner so that was new you, you see this is what i'm saying that it's cool but you know it's kind of gimmicky mm. you know it's let's entertain the you know the women's cricket game by giving some points at the end it has to be more serious yeah. it has to be there has to be an end game to each format and that's what makes it entire that's what gets fans to the table right if you have a world test championship final between india versus australia at lords men or women people will show up so that's how you make it go all, all right guys let's give ishan a breather now i will take over for the f1 update i have to say uh, when i saw the qualifiers when i saw the weather i wasn't very sure this is going to go ahead but it did go ahead and i saw the last 5 laps what a heartbreak man i mean it was a, actually the entire race can be summed up as how mclaren blew it uh, instead of hamilton winning the race let's start off with lando norris uh, you know he started off the race at pole position he almost immediately lost it to hamilton because hamilton had a very aggressive start but you know norris got way went way wide and hamilton almost overtook him but throughout the race there were quite a lot of ups and downs in terms of mclaren and the controlling of the car in the rain you know in the wet surfaces and it actually happened in the penultimate lap when Nor- norris spun out gave hamilton the lead and that's how where that's where hamilton finished but even without you no know, not talking about norris you look at ricardo uh he was in near in near about the podium finish and he had a literally a 7 second delay in his pit stop which cost him significant you know places and seconds and he ended up finishing fourth but you know he could have been on podium so the result was pretty you know basic when it comes to who finished one and two but it could have been a whole lot difference because that's you know it could have been dramatic you know imagine a you know a mclaren ferrari on the podium and hamilton was tapping not in the points yeah. that was that's how the race started uh, because verstappen started at the back of the grid and he came all the way back to second right so the points table hamilton has now finally taken a lead in the championship table by two points uh, verstappen who came second now you know again second in the uh, in the championship Mercedes has also taken a lead in terms of the constructors because Perez who's having a atrocious time uh finished 9th whereas Bottas finished 5th so it was a great wild wild race if you guys missed it please see the highlights because watching an F1 race in rainy weather rainy climate wet wet surfaces it, it just goes all down to how a driver can deal with that pressure with almost zero visibility it's unbelievable how it's even humanly possible that they can navigate at that speed so do catch the highlights it's on hotstar check it out but this even gets even better because you're seeing the likes of norris ricardo and even surprisingly carlos sainz who not had a very good season so far coming onto the podium you're seeing ferrari also make a comeback so it's going to go down to the wire because these players these constructors will keep challenging Uh, the Mercedes and uh, the Red Bull for the podium so it's going to be interesting that's a wrap guys so when we come back on Thursday we'll talk about the midweek Champions League games there are some juicy fixtures PSG versus Manchester City what is that called El Oilico what did we say El Gasico <laughs> El Gasico the El Gasico guys and also we have uae versus chelsea a very depleted uae morata gone dibala gone so we'll all see how that's going to turn up so until then it is bye from bala and bye from ishan guys see you with some see you soon with some champions league results some upsets thank you everyone for listening 
If you enjoyed what you heard, please make sure you hit the subscribe button and also please, like we are literally begging to rate our podcast on whichever app you are listening to. It not only helps us, but also helps new listeners to find our podcast easily. You can also reach out to us on Twitter and Instagram at the rate Sports Charcha. A big shout out to the Jam Room Audio for our theme music. You can follow the Jam Room on Facebook at the rate The Jam Room Audio. Bye. Absolutely world class.